Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Influence Lab webinar tonight. So fun to have you with us again. It's been a while since we had our last one. But we are so, so thrilled to have a new group joining us tonight from Atlanta, Georgia. Woohoo! Welcome, Atlanta, to the Influence Lab. We know that you are launching your first event there tonight, an in person gathering to watch the webinar. And we're so excited to have you with us and to join us in this community, in this movement to see Christians use media more effectively and align their faith and their career together. So we're on a journey together. We're uh, just having a good time uh, sharing each other's talents and skills and getting to know each other, both here in Los Angeles and now there in Atlanta. So look for the next Influence Lab gathering coming up in April. And also, we're hoping to launch the first in-person large gathering there in Atlanta. So again, welcome, Atlanta. We're so happy to have you with us. Welcome to all of you who are joining us around the United States, many of you coming in from many other countries. Um, I've been honored and privileged to speak and teach around the world, around the globe the last few years. And I know that many of you are coming in from all over the globe. We have people coming in from Australia, South America, America, the Philippines, um, just in England, all over the place. So welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so fun to have you. Tonight's uh, focus and theme is redeeming your media career, keeping your integrity. And we're so thrilled tonight to have a producer with us in here in Hollywood, Cindy Bond. And we're going to be uh, bringing her in in just a few minutes. I want to just share with you a few things, though, about the Influence Lab for those of you who are just joining us for the first time tonight. The Influence Lab was uh, uh, launched, as I said earlier, to help Christians use media more effectively and to help you and grow your faith and um, your skills and talents. And we, we gather to encourage each other and we want to elevate the name of Jesus and we want to elevate you in helping um, the kingdom of God flourish in your work and your career. The Influence Lab publishes a weekly journal, so I hope that you will uh, if, sign up for that journal if you haven't done so yet. You can do so at influencelab.com. It's a weekly journal of um, blogs and information. We have a uh, monthly interview, an I-N-N-E-R-V-I-E-W, an interview with a leading industry expert that can help give you tips and mentor you and, again, help you and encourage you with your faith and career. We love you and we'd love for you to follow us on social media. It's so important these days for all of us to join together in our thoughts and in the content that we're producing here. We'd love to get your feedback. So again, if you can send us your questions or some feedback about the webinar tonight, we love hearing back from you. You can do that at info at influencelab.com. Again, info at influencelab.com. The Influence Lab is pleased tonight to have have sponsors. Our company, Cook Media Group, is one of the sponsors, and as well as Emily, who's running for state assembly here in Los Angeles in the Long Beach area. Emily has been a longtime member of the Influence Lab. She's on our advisory board, and uh, we are honored and privileged to have Emily uh, supporting us tonight and helping us pay for the expenses that these happen. You can partner with us, too. So I hope that you will check out the donation page at Influence influencelab.com. There are three books there for, that you can choose. If you become a $25 donate, donator, uh, you can choose one of those books. Or you can have all three of them tonight if you choose to become a recurring uh, donor. We have expenses in putting out the journal and the webinars and the in-person gatherings. So you know how all those things go. Uh, but we are uh, wanting to build this community. We know it's important to you and to our world and our culture today that Christians are taught to use media more effectively and we want to mentor you and encourage your life. So I hope that you'll partner with us in that and in, in, uh, in uh, supporting the Influence Lab.
Okay, so let's get to it tonight. Um, I am so excited to be talking about our theme tonight. You know, tonight's webinar is about uh, forgiveness. It's about integrity. It's about God's love that is enduring and lasting and about his continual redeeming love for us in our lives. As uh, you may have read in the little introduction uh, for the webinar, we live in a media-driven culture. We live in a culture of media where there are many promises told to us, many times lies that are given to us, things, uh, places where we're taken advantage of, maybe uh, looked over. Um, many actors live in a world of rejection These because every time you go for an audition, you get rejected or a writer producing something. We get rejected a lot and uh, we have to navigate in a very challenging, very competitive world. And how do, can we continue to do that with integrity? Well, one of the reasons I wanted to bring Cindy Abon into this conversation is because of her latest film, Redeeming Love. If you haven't seen it, please get out to that to the theaters and and support that th that uh, movie. We'll be talking about it here in just a few minutes. But Cindy's theme of her movie is based on the book from Hosea. And you know, uh, if you haven't read Hosea, that's going to be one of your assignments tonight, is to go back and read Hosea. It's so important. As in, and as you read Hosea, remember John 3.16, for God so loved the world. He loves us and he loves you. And, and yet we make many times choices and uh, we live in a very challenging uh, culture and world today. And the film focuses on those kind of things. Um, and Francine Rivers' book has been so dynamic. So we'll talk about that here in a minute with Cindy. But the story of redeeming love is often harsh. Um, many times it may be difficult to even watch it, be but the reality is that the world in our culture today is harsh. We are living in a very challenging and disruptive culture, but the Bible says that we can be overcomers. We can be, that his blood, his love for us redeems us in no matter what choices we have made and no matter what disruptions that come our way. It's the theme of what we're gonna be talking about tonight, that forgiveness that uh, the way we can forgive the unforgiven forgiven and bring hope to the hopeless. So we're going to get right to it tonight. I'm going to bring Cindy Bond into the picture. As she pops on, I'm going to read a little bit about who. Hi, Cindy. So fun to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everyone tuning in. I'm so excited. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we are excited to have you. Let me tell you a little bit about Cindy. You know, Cindy, we've known her since the 1990s, believe it or not. I went back when I was uh, <laughs> looking at all of our reviewing all this tour tonight. And um, we've known Cindy for a few years. And uh, you know, my husband came in and we were talking about Cindy and he said, I remember my first meeting with Cindy. Uh, I had a great meeting with her. It was fantastic. And I, I even remember the day he came home from that meeting, Cindy, because he was so wow. excited to meet you. <laughs> but oh he God. brought in five scripts that day and you rejected every single oh one no. of them. <laughs> oh no. But you know what? He loved it. Because, Cindy, you're honest and you're truthful and you know the business and you know the stuff that he had in his little satchel that day wasn't going to cut it. And yet you were encouraging to him and brought hope and encouragement into his life. And uh, so let me tell you a little bit about Cindy for those of you who don't know her. In 1996, Cindy co-founded Noran Entertainment. And then in 1998, she launched Providence Entertainment and released the number one independent film of 1999, The Omega Code. And uh, my husband was one of the uh, directors on that film. So we were, it was a fun project to work with her on. In 2002, Cindy and the, um, and the former Paramount Pictures president and MGM co-chairman, uh, Frank Yablon, uh, Yablones went on and co-founded Mission Pictures International in 2008. And that year, Cindy, along with the Phoenix, uh, with Phoenix 
Pictures Vice President Doug McKay also co-founded yet another production company, Faster Horse Pictures. She never quits, I'll tell you. With over 200 films to date, including I Can Only Imagine, which was the number one independent film of 1918, or excuse me, 1918, listen to me, 2018. <laughs> I know, hello. Where oh, did I come boy. up with that one? 2018, Cindy created and produced her most recent production now of Redeeming Love with Universal Pictures. She released it here uh, wide in February of 2022. And Cindy, you know, you continue to produce and release thought-provoking and yet entertaining films. Because look, when we go to film movies, we want to be entertained, but we also want to have some thought when we leave. And yeah. so your talent and skill and knowledge has been so dynamic and so fantastic. And uh, you've brought excellence to not only the industry, but also you've changed our lives in so many ways. So uh, we're so pleased to have you with us tonight, Cindy. Um, you know, the film that we'll just kind of jump into this here is, um, is about forgiveness. It's about having to forgive people that we may not ever be able to forgive because they've done such horrendous things to us in our lives. And yet that's what God does for us. Why is this film, particularly with everything going on in our culture and our world today, why is this film so important to us right now? Speak to that for a second. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a story, I mean, definitely about forgiveness, but it's also about, you know, God's unconditional love for us that no matter what we've done in our life, we're all sinners. Um, or, you know, you could be somebody who's been the victim. I mean, we're all sinners no matter what. But on top of that, you could be, have been the victim of some, you know, horrendous, um, you know, wrongdoing uh, where, for example, this story is about an orphan girl who ends up being trafficked. So, I mean, the worst of circumstances. Um, and, you know, whether you're the sinner that nothing like that's happened to you or someone that like our lead character, Angel, the life she's starts out as Sarah and she becomes, you know, she's in this, she's trafficked and then grows up in the life of prostitution. There's nothing ever that you can do that will ever separate you from the unconditional love and forgiveness and redemption offer that God gives to each one of us. So, I mean, as far as forgiveness goes, I mean, there's a line in the movie that has been so powerful that, you know, how can, you know, we not forgive someone else when we've been forgiven so much. And, mm. you know, it's, it's the, the movie's just full of, you know, freeing us from the shame and the guilt. I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak to as a woman, you know, in terms of this is a, a movie that was, you know, mostly made by women for women about women. And, um, you know, forgiveness is not just forgiving others, but it's also forgiving yourself, you know, asking God to forgive you and to cleanse you and letting those things go and knowing that he's, I mean, this movie is a baptism, knowing that he's freeing you of this, the guilt and the shame that I think most women carry into their adult life and, and throughout. So, you know, guilt and shame right now is just um, all over, mainly because of social media. We live in this world of, um, I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not something enough. And yes. it's, it's really being propelled a lot by social media, but the themes of this movie, I just, I think are so relevant for this time. You know, the book came out in 1991. So mm -hmm. why did it take so long for this movie to come out? Why did we have this big long gap? Oh boy. Well, it was such a difficult movie to make because it big budget I mean, this is a movie set in the California gold rush. That's our backdrop in the 1850s. Uh, so, I mean, it's a big sweeping epic romance. Uh, so, you know, period piece, costumes, wardrobe, I mean, you know, costumes, makeup, hair, I mean, set design. It's just huge from a physical production standpoint, but the book is 464 pages long. And I mean, to really tell the entire book the way it's written is a mini series. So, um, you know, in this case, I went forward and my, I had read the book over 15 years ago and my goal was always to make it into a feature film. That's the only way I saw this movie on the big screen. I just had that vision. And so, I mean, 
it went through, uh, there were a lot of producers, some friends, you know, of ours that had the rights, wonderful producers. It was just tough to adapt. And when I finally got the rights in about seven years ago, I just really was very prayerful and, and in my heart of hearts, just, you know, where God, you know, was touching my heart. I just felt that Francine was the only one that could probably properly adapt her own book into script, which by the way, in Hollywood is rare. Mm -hmm. It's not often that an author actually adapts their own book because they're two different mediums and it's very hard to condense and see the forest through the trees. And when I was going through that, when we were starting to work together, she'd already been writing the script. <laughs> wow. And wow. then when we did our deal, there's the first draft. I was blown away that she did that. And then I went to read it and she did it. Fantastic job. Wow. She literally distilled all those pages down into a two hour movie. Wow. Yeah. And you're right. You know, to have the, the, the author of the book also write the screenplay. I mean, she knows the heart of it. She knows, you know, the backbone of it, the through line. And, um, and that's really quite unusual to have that, mm -hmm. that privilege, that honor, you know, that ability to be able to do both. Yep. So uh, I'm sure it was fabulous working with Francine and, and uh, she has such depth uh, and knowledge and um, wisdom. So uh, she's she's someone we need to get on the Influence Lab yeah. webinar next, do. don't we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Talk I'm about sure. writing, maybe. Yeah, maybe I'm you could put that so hint in her life. In her, yes, in her. <laughs> I, I will. I'll make sure I do that. I mean, she was absolutely wonderful to work with. Um, she not only co-wrote the script. Um, I brought in the director, DJ Caruso. They wrote together, and then Francine was also executive producer of this movie and involved in every decision along the way. And so I just knew in order to do this, uh, you know, adapt this book faithfully onto the big screen as a major motion picture, I needed to go with her lockstep. And that's what we did. And I have to tell you the absolute most wonderful experience to work with her. Just such a mm. blessing, never a moment of dissension or anything. It was just iron sharpens iron really to, to you know with her she's got such a humility and grace about her and and I know yes. there's some things we'll talk about in terms of difficulties and challenges that we all face in the industry but boy some storms came and she she was just like well we're just gonna trust Jesus over there and walk on the water like Peter just let's That's not awesome. worry about it let's stay faithful and just keep our eyes on him we're gonna get through this yeah. Well, let's go into that. What what was maybe your biggest challenge? I know I've heard a little bit of a, some pushback on the film from some Christians who look at it and they've even call, I've seen some call it pornography um, <laughs> because it's sexual, right? I mean, who wants to, you know, I mean, it, it is sexual, but that's what the book of Hosea is all about, right? So right. how, you know, we have to portray that. So what yeah. were some of those challenges that you had? What's the, What's that pushback you've been feeling? Well, I mean, I was going to, I was thinking, we're talking about the challenges. I split in into two parts. There were a lot of challenge to, challenges to get the movie made because of the budget. And we needed a lot of money to produce excellence, which has been something I've always strived to do. Um, and the fact that it is a period piece and, you know, it was just a big production, the difficulty adapting, I mean, the pro whole process. But I, you know, making the film and then it was one thing. And then I feel my greatest challenge um, has been since the film has been released, because I always knew and um, my producing partners, we always figured that we would get a lot of pushback and, and a lot of criticism from the far left. But we didn't expect the amount of friendly fire, let's call it. And the thing that's been frustrating, so it's been a big challenge that and it's 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 been rough because the thing that's been really rough about it is a lot of these voices, they haven't seen the film. They haven't read the book. And, and I'm, well, I did a book adaptation here. I worked with the author. We did a faithful adaptation of her book, which by the way, was very controversial as well back in 1991 when it was first published. So, I mean, this is what it is. And we know the prophet Hosea was called and told by God to marry a prostitute. And, you know, at, to your point, life is messy often. And every one of us has, you know, been in a place that's been rough. And certainly there's a lot of uh, people, women and 
you know, we're speaking to so many women out there. I mean, trafficking is the number three biggest crime business in the world, $150 billion annually. It's, it's just horrific. A heinous, horrible crime uh, that's taking place, mostly women, but also young boys. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, you know, I, the frustration for me is that, you know, listen, we didn't make a religious film. We made a film for the redeemed and those looking to be redeemed, those that need hope, that, that want to be delivered, that, you know, have lost all their hope, that are just, I mean, this, this is God's unconditional love story. It's his love letter to the world. That's this movie. And it's a super powerful story of redemption. So, yes. you know, I, I wish that it, it's funny in Hollywood, you, you make a movie like Redeeming Love. We never labeled it a quote faith-based film. We never labeled it a quote Christian film. Others put that label on us and, and Hollywood's quick to, or those people are quick to put you in a box and label you. What about the fact that we Universal Studios stepped up? Universal top executives there. I mean, I know that some top executives actually cried watching this movie. They were so deeply and profoundly impacted. What about celebrating the fact that it's a hurting world out there and people need to see a story that's full of hope and deliverance and love. And as far as the, as yes, there are love scenes, which I have to say, uh, unless you're living under a rock and you never drive by a beach or you never flip through a cable channel that you're going to see much worse, you know, if you're looking yes. on a beach or, uh, and, you know, or literally flipping through a cable channel. I mean, you could, I actually saw much worse things on the front page of Fox News Network's website. I mean, so yeah. I find it a little hypocritical. And plus, DJ Caruso said it great. He said, hey, I'm directing a love scene between them for a, a, with a married couple. When does that happen? Yeah. When do you actually yes. see yeah. and and, yeah. and we're very tasteful. We're, we're, we shot this gracefully and tasteful. We didn't... Well, it's not long, but it's a pivotal part of the movie, a pivotal mm -hmm. part. So, you know, it's, yeah. look, this story is gritty. This story is raw. It's PG-13. I wouldn't recommend anyone under probably 15 or 16 years old to see this because it's trafficking. I mean, it's got some tough subject matter, but so does life. So does life. Yep. Yep. So true. Well, so, you know, statistics tell us, uh, Cindy, that the viewing rights of the secular audience and the viewing rights of the Christian audience are pretty much the same. Right. <laughs> we are all watching the same stuff. Yes, y yes, exactly. There's a, there are actually uh, studies that have been done. The audience that watches Yellowstone, um, and I think that watch Redeem, <laughs> I mean, the people that are complaining probably are watching Yellowstone. And I can tell you, absolutely, I've watched Yellowstone way edgier than redeeming love yeah really yeah edgy. so hey hey uh, didn't you uh didn't francine rivers write a couple great blogs on her website about some of this she did so if you go to francinerivers.com she wrote two brilliant blogs one about sex and michael hosea and then another one about sex trafficking and angel they're brilliant blogs and she goes right into it and she was um, like I said, she's such a graceful, you know, prayerful, faithful woman. And she just sought the Lord on this and felt now was the time to speak out because yes. we're not looking to, I, I'm not looking to come across angry or anything. It's, it's, it's frustrating because I mean, look guys, it, this story is a powerful story of redemption. The most incredible story, you know, of redemption here, uh, as we know in the Bible, Hosea, Gomer and Hosea. And this is inspired. Yes. This is an allegory. This is an allegory. And it's inspired by the biblical story, faithful to the book. So I wear this movie like a badge of honor. I always will, even though I've taken some pretty good pot shots. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Yeah, you have. Yes, the, you have. There are always, there's Pharisees and money changers and okay, I'm here. Well, that, that just speaks to, you know, how we have to trust God in this business, because, um, you know, whether we're an actor or writer, producer, we're always, always going to be put in one of those situations where we're going to get criticized. I know writers here in, in Hollywood that I've worked with that have sat around some controversial uh, series and movies, but they say, had I not been around that 
table, the direction of the writing would have gone completely in the wrong direction, even worse. And you know what happens whenever someone around that writing table, one, some of the other writers, some of the other producers or people who are involved in the production, when they're going through a divorce, when they're having problems with their children or going through drugs an alcohol addiction or some challenge with their health, guess who they come to when, yeah. when those things are happening? They yeah. came to me and I was able to share my faith in the hope of Jesus with them and who Jesus Amen. could be in their lives. Yeah. And that's what God, it's a mission field, isn't it, Cindy? It is. That, it is he puts field. us in these situations and we're not um, to abuse the name of the Lord. We're not to abuse the content, but to, uh, to be and sp to speak the language of the culture and to be that light and that salt yes. in our culture today. And with absolutely. The, yeah. And with this topic of love, I mean, again, I'll, I'll just address head on the love scenes in this movie, as I said, it's between a married couple and Hosea, Michael Hosea our in our movies, a farmer, not a prophet, but he represents the you know Christ in our allegory. He's here. We are mid eighteen fifties, and you know California gold rush, all that represented. And he marries her, yet he waits for her. He doesn't say. I mean, you could. I mean, all the westerns we've seen where it's not hard to imagine when the the male characters are like, okay, woman, we're married, let's go, right? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, you can right. easily imagine that probably happened. Um, but here in this movie, he waits for her. He's married to her, but he waits until she's ready. He's sensitive. He's, his love is unconditional, unjudgmental. Just like, I mean, he represents Jesus. That God. Yeah. He represents God. God's yeah, waiting for us, God's isn't he? Waiting for us. He's always there. Yes. Always, always waiting for us to make that move first. That's Amen. what's so beautiful about Amen. this. Yes. Yep. Waiting he, for us. It's God. Yes. 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 Awake. Yeah. So it's so, so, so beautiful. Yeah. So um, how would you encourage um, the uh, industry people today, writers, producers, specifically women who are put in challenging pos positions in the industry? How can we press forward? How can we trust God that maybe when we turn down that script that we know we shouldn't be involved in, or we're in, we're putting in a, in a challenging situation. How, how have you learned to trust God in those, those, those situations yourself? Well, um, I'll start with, I really feel it's critically important. Of course, priorities are critical. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall come unto you. And in that regard, really, um, when you're asking him, you know, and you're asking for the desires of your heart to give for him to give you the desires of your heart, you know, really examine what those are, because it's really important. If you're getting called into the motion picture business or the, the industry, the media, you, and you're someone that's a believer that wants to shape and shift culture through media to impact hearts and minds for the kingdom, that you're in the right lane. Uh, mm -hmm. because it's tinsel town, it's the bright lights, it's all that, it's very alluring and seductive, but it's super important to be f just rooted in your, with your faith in God, because, and that's the rock, because if you're not planted firmly on the rock, which is your faith in Christ, those storms are going to come, and when they come, mm -hmm. if you're not on that rock, you're going to get blown out to sea, and <laughs> I don't think we're finding you. Um, then for me, my family has been critically important. Um, my husband, Steve, my daughter, Ashley, my son, Dylan. Um, my, I feel work learning the, the scripture about my people perish for lack of knowledge. I think it's in Hosea. Yes. It's in Hosea. Yes, it is. And, that yeah, is. It's in Hosea. So my, my people perish for lack of knowledge. I know that's about learning the word, but I think it's applicable to the motion picture industry. It's show business, not show art. And I think it's very important that you learn that um, and keep the full full armor of God on all the time, like I said, because the storms will come. But it, but going back, it is super important to know exactly what you're calling, that you are, in fact, called to this industry. And if you are, what is your calling? Is it for you to be in front of the camera or behind the camera, to be live action or animation, to be, you know, 
this case, a producer, a director, a screenwriter, uh, all there's so many different uh, jobs that you know someone could have in this industry. So it's very important to really know where you are and then persevere, don't give up. Um, you know, stay the course. You know, Cindy, you know, you talked about Tinseltown. You know, I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada. Oh. And um, sometimes I look back at my, why God had me grow up there is because I think he was preparing me to grow, to, to have a life here in Hollywood. You know, I, I saw what happened behind those bright lights. Mm -hmm. I saw the real things that happened in people's lives when, when the lights went dim. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, I always say, uh, I remember the day my, I woke up as a young child and my father was sitting at the table as he did every sun, every morning before he went to work, reading the newspaper. You know, back then we got our news on the news at the newspapers. And uh, he was reading to me that Las Vegas would be the first city in the nation to lock down the windows in the hotel room. So they would only open just a, a portion because so many people were, were jumping out of them. Mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, Nevada still has the highest suicide rate of all the states in the United States. Um, we have people who, you know, who I grew up around people who came to make their fame and fortune there. And I saw the devastation that happened behind those great big, big lights. And uh, so it kind of prepared me to, to go into Hollywood. You know, I grew up to, to Sydney with my favorite um, toy growing up was a, an outdoor trash can full of costumes. I would make up my own stories and create my own characters. And everyone asked me, you know, how, how did I get into the business? What, what, what made me want to get into the business? And I, and it was kind of just my DNA. What about you, Cindy? What drew you into this business? And, and when did you realize that this was the entertainment business was the one you wanted to invest your life into? Well, I, I didn't know it until I was in my early twenties because I, I was a big movie. I loved movies growing up. I was raised by my grandparents and I, we just loved, uh, Rogers and Hammerstein, uh, 10 commandments, DeMille, all the big sweeping epic biblical worldview movies. I just cherished them. And I didn't know anyone in the movie business at all because I, you know, was, well, I was raised up in Northern California, but, um, and then I was uh, going towards uh, trying to be a touring pro because golf was, I was actually an athlete um, working on becoming a professional golfer and with the goal of being a touring pro. And wow. of course that, <laughs> that, that all went to the <laughs> side when I met my husband, future husband, <laughs> uh, Steve Bond, and he was an actor and he had uh, been born in Israel, came to the States as a 12 year old and was the jungle boy in, in the last Tarzan movie. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And so when we met, uh, he, uh, and we dated for a couple of years before he got married, he, he was an actor. And so I started taking acting class and it was during that time that I was taking acting class and soon realizing that, uh, it's kind of funny, actually, I was probably, um, uh, I did probably more song and dance routines on stage than anybody else in class because my acting teacher knew that's not what she wants to do. <laughs> she finally took <laughs> me on me and said, you, you can sit down. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it was interesting because being in that acting class and before that, I had actually worked at Wells Fargo Bank there for a while. So I had the, the business part and the show came together. Uh, it was through that whole experience as an actor that I segued to becoming a producer. And, and once I was, I went on the other side of the camera, I knew right then and there, I was called to the industry. I just didn't know what place I was supposed to be in. And when that happened, I had that piece. I knew that I knew that's my calling. And the, the beauty kind of going back to one question that you'd ask is that, the funny thing is about all this is that we really, we don't know what the future is. God does. So you might think, well, I'm supposed to be in this industry, but why am I over here doing this other thing? And then all of a sudden you get down the road five or 10 years and you go, ah, that's why, because I needed mm -hmm. to go through this lesson or learn that, you know, equip myself on, in these different ways in order to be prepared for what he has ahead of me. 
So that was so true. So I got into these husbands of ours get get us in all sorts of troubles. It was my husband too that that drugged me into the business. You know, I went, I, I told you, I, I grew up with this trash can full of costumes and making stories, but I never dreamed I could actually make a living at it or actually pay bills with it. And uh, until I had my first baby and kind of was getting bored, just, just being a mom, which is what I wanted to be, but you know, I was, I'm a doer. And mm-hmm. so he, he came home and said, what do you want to do with your life? And I, you know, he said, I'd love to be an actress. And so he said, then go for it. And uh, so those husbands of ours, they're, they're pretty cool, aren't they? Every once yes. in a while, they come through with the right thing, don't they? Yes, and, I, uh, yeah, I'm blessed because <laughs> my husband was always so supportive of me. And, and it was funny because for the first, he was a big star on General Hospital. So we got married. He became this big star in, on General Hospital. Good four-year run. I was home with our daughter at the time. And then the table turned and my producing career took off. And then he's been so supportive and, and wonderful. My, my other half. <laughs> definitely. Yes. Have you ever thought about giving up? What do you oh. do when you get, when, when you get into those um, mopey moments? No, you know, like we never have those, of course, I, ha ha ha. But uh, you know, there are times in this industry that it's a roller coaster. you're up and then you're down and it's, and it, it's really a challenge. What, what do you, what have you done when you felt like giving up or can you tell us a little bit about what you do what yeah yeah I was thinking about it there was one time that when you're when as a believer when you're in the industry as I mentioned being a media missionary I I was and have been on the front lines of this battle for hearts and minds for many years and you just get worn down and you get hit hard uh at times and um it can be very lonely you know I, I mean as a woman there weren't hardly any other women. So there were some difficult times there. And there was a particular time when I was really getting hit personally and professionally. And I really went into a place of a reset where I just put my face on the ground to God. And I just put my hands up and just prayed. And what came to me from the Lord was uh, sit on your hands, be patient, know that I'm God that I am in control and I will work all this out together for the good. And he did. Mm. And it was an incredibly difficult time. I was really close to just giving it all up because the, the battle, the attacks were really substantial. They were significant. So, but it, it, again, God knew that was going to happen. And he, he, he did work it all together for the good. And because I went through that, I was prepared for what was ahead of me. And I wouldn't have been prepared. It really, Mm -hmm. it really, you get to another place in terms of the choices you make and learn, get, you know, um, gaining wisdom and discernment. And I've leaned on, we talk about um, being gentle as the dove, but God also says, be be wise as a serpent. And I- Wise as a serpent, that's right. Yeah. And I found a lot of times I was dumb as a dove sometimes. And, <laughs> and, and oh. it was like wise as a serpent and, you know, gentle as a dove. So it's together, but I needed, I needed to learn a, a lot. And I'm a lifelong student. I, I just feel, try to sip greatness off as many people as you can always be a student. The, this industry, especially so multifaceted. Yeah. Yeah. The industry can, can, can swap, can chew you up and swallow you. And, uh, and I found, you know, for me, it was my personal engagement with God. Um, we can go to church, we can watch preachers, we can do webinars like this, all these kind of things are great, but it's really gets down to your personal engagement with God. It's why I wrote my devotional hope for today. Stay con- connected to God in a, dis- in a distracted culture, because we're living in a very distracted culture these days. And God is calling us in these times more than ever before, I believe, to stay personally engaged with him. You know, and 
and in the book I went on to do the research for showed the research that the book is the devotional is based on is an eight year million dollar study on the habits and activities of Christians and what we do that actually changes the direction of our lives. And they found in this study that if you're not reading your Bible four or more times a week, you'll make no significant choices or changes any different from someone who never reads the Bible. And so four or more times, you know, uh, uh, physical, uh, physical trainers will teach you to work out four or more times a week because our bodies have to be engaged, right? Well, what about our inside body, our soul that's going to live for eternity? This outside body is going to fall away and die and shrivel up and turn to dust one day. But our insides, our soul is going to live for eternity. So what are we doing to build up and and engage with God so that that eternal soul will then... um, be engaged with him. And then that's, that's the resource. That's our resource for me. That's that, that's where there, where it lies, isn't it? In those times and challenges, you know, that the industry's really changed a lot from the time I be, uh, came out here in 1991 as a woman, how has it changed for you as a woman in many ways? Can you speak oh, to that a little bit? Yeah, dramatically. I mean, in so many ways. I mean, there are a lot more women in positions of influence. I I mean, the funny thing is I always found very interesting is that the majority of the media buying decisions for families are really made by women. And for so long decades, it's been by a large margin, men running an industry that women make decisions, media buying decisions for. So it was, I never lined up. I think, wait a minute. I think I, I know a little better than than a middle-aged, you know, gentleman, uh, you know, that may be single and, and different worldview. I think I know better, you know, I encourage women to go out there and, and get into the media and especially directing. I think we have a big lack of female directors. And I think that, uh, I mean, I'd love to, to direct, but boy, is that, that's a whole nother job, but I really encourage women to get into that to get in, yes. especially if they have a calling to direct is would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I taught at a couple of universities over the last few years and they were predominantly in the cinema and media arts department dominated by males, yep. but I beginning to see that has change and we need women who are writers and producers and directors, you know, mm-hmm. so many women will go into a theatrical acting, mm-hmm. but, um, but we need DPs, directors of p- photography. Yep. You know, I, we need them out there. We need lighting directors. We need them, uh, we need people in the accounting seats and in the green lighting seats. You know, there are great jobs out there. So I would encourage women myself to get out there and go for it. Um, I think one of the challenges I see women is they don't feel like they're qualified enough. You know, they, they that's always kind of it, they, they, they are in a man's world and they don't quite feel like they can do it because they haven't been trained well enough or been, uh, they don't feel within that they have the talents enough, but God says he's enough, isn't he? <laughs> he yes. can, he's enough in our lives and, yeah. uh, he, he can come through and, um, give us and teach us and direct us where we need to, to go in order to do those, the things that he's called us to do. So a good word, good word. I love that. I give that. I've, I've seen myself from a theatrical acting point of view, things change so much over the years. It's uh, it's time right now for women yes. to move forward and it's never a better time right now. There's, oh. they're looking for women's scripts. They're looking for women's projects, aren't they? Yes. Yes. It's, it's the best. And so don't let fear or doubt hold anyone that's seeing this. Don't let fear or doubt hold you back. If this is where you're supposed to be, because God's got a calling on your life, be bold. Um, as I said, seek first, you know, keep your priorities in line because we do have to juggle a lot. If, you know, being wives and, and mothers and all that, um, it, it, it's possible. Uh, but you need to have your support group, but be bold and don't let, you know, that, uh, you know, that voice of fear and doubt, which we know who's you know whispering that in our ear, take you down right. because you know God's given you and me the free will to make a choice to be above our circumstances or below them. And but you know I've chosen to be an overcomer, and I think that's what you know we have to be because again the storms are going to come in showbiz. So 
You got to choose to be above the circumstances that will present, be presented to you as you journey forward in Hollywood. Um, yes. But it's, it's a battle, but that's why full armor of God and get in there, be bold. Um, don't let the you know voice of doubt and fear, you know, take those thoughts captive. That's what I do. Yeah. Is there one particular thing you would encourage us as filmmakers in the industry, as professionals in the industry that we need to possess in order to be successful in the industry? Have you found one particular thing that uh, you would say you need to really nail this down to be successful? I Well, I'll speak as a producer. Um, it's, I think, to be a successful producer. Um, because we're we're the ones that are the parent of a movie. We're birthing this baby. You know? Yeah, great it's way to, to say find, it. Yeah, you know, is to find to search out the for the to find the great stories. Because you know it, it you have to have a great story to then uh, create a great script from, and a great script is the fountain from which all things spring forth to make a movie. It's the roadmap. So. You know, it, it's really we're storytellers. But what was Jesus? He, you know, in terms of how he taught, he taught in parable, he taught in story. So storytelling is can be super powerful. I mean, where do you get two hours of someone's attention to pour into them? I mean, that that's pretty, especially in this day and age, that's yeah. really remarkable. But I do find to really get in there and and find those great stories, and then really take your time to. Um, you know, get these scripts in great shape because too often, just most often, can I say not too often, I say most often the scripts are not good. <laughs> and I'm not trying to be bad on Phil back in the day when he gave me. Yeah, I was just going to say, is that why you rejected those five scripts from my <laughs> husband? Thinking, they um, were bad. Yeah, no, 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 not at all. It might be, you could actually have a really good script, but the story is kind of like, well, that feels very familiar. So you, you really have to, uh, you know, find a story that I think that's unique and that really pulls, for me, pulls at the heartstrings and um, contain characters that you really care about. Because if you don't care about the characters that you that are in a screenplay, you don't care what happens to them. And it's a journey and that the character in the beginning is has learned a lot. They're different at the end. So, I mean, um, yeah, and that's certainly the case. I think about uh, when it produced, I can only imagine, I mean, the character, <laughs> Of, of Bart and his father all the way from the beginning to the end. And of course, Angel from the beginning to the end and Redeeming Love. Right. I mean, yes. huge character arcs, big change. Yeah. In both yes, storytelling is is the essence of it all. You, uh, you got to start with the words on the page, don't you, before you start yeah. anywhere. And uh, that's what Jesus did in yes. our lives and is so important. He told stories and he asked questions. And yes. uh, that's what we need to be doing in our films too, is, is we don't always have to say all the answers at the end of the film, do we? You can leave yes. the audience with a question. In fact, right. those are the fun films I love the most is I can mm -hmm. leave a film and then say, hey, let's go have some coffee or let's go and uh, let's talk about this. And uh, it's the questions at the end that I, you know, that we ask each other. So a script writing is just so important. I also, you know, I offer myself too. I, I, I think you nailed it a few minutes ago when you said support. Um, I think we need each other and we need the influence lab. We need groups like this. We need our church. We need, uh, we need our, 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 uh, our peeps around us, so to speak, uh, to uh, encourage us, don't we? And to support us. We need our parents and uh, support us in prayer, support us in uh, just giving us a, you know, a pat on the back when we're in those, those low moments and those challenging times. And uh, we certainly have been blessed to have great husbands around us and great families yeah. around us. But I know a lot of women out there are single. There's yes. a lot of single women out there in this business and right. that gets challenging. And so that's why we need a group like this, like the Influence Lab yes. Women's Group is yes. to be able to come together as a community and uh, and to be able to help each other. So, so Cindy, we got just a few minutes left, but we'll, we'll have a chat room here. And I know there's probably several people who've been asking questions in the Q&A room. One last couple last questions. We'll wrap this up here pretty soon is what's your next project? What are you working on right now? Well, I have a lot of projects I'm working on, uh, some I can't yet mention, but there is one that is my absolute favorite that I will mention 
It's called The Love Ladies, and it's um, based on a true story uh, off of a book called Miss Brenda and the Love Ladies, yeah. and uh, it's set in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, we're I'm, actually, my partner Doug and I are working with a company called Juvie, and that's owned by Julius Tennant and Viola Davis. So they're- Oh, partner. wow. Yes. Two small names there in the industry. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so excited about this movie because it's it just has enormous potential, true story, and um, so relevant to, to, for today. And I think it has the potential of a blind side. I mean, that level mm. of, you know, reach with this particular movie. So. Oh, exactly. great. Well, we'll have to look for that one for sure. Where yeah. can we see Redeeming Love? I know it's in a limited distribution. Uh, what's yeah. the best way we can see it if we haven't seen it? Yes. Well, we opened January 21. We've been out in theaters now just a little over a month. Um, and so it, we are in limited uh, theaters at this point. But if you go to Fandango.com and you punch in your zip code, it'll, it'll show you where theater is, the closest theater where you live. But other than that, we're right now on uh, digital sell-through and digital rentals. So Apple, uh, Amazon, Vudu, Walmart site, et cetera. So anyway, I'd love everyone to see the movie. I think absolutely blessed by it. Yes, yes. Well, I we we saw it the first week it was out. So uh, I know those first couple of weeks are important for uh, box office results. Yeah. But uh, but still, if you haven't seen it, uh, please do. And uh, then yeah, I'm sure it'll be coming out um, uh, in one of the other online platforms uh, coming up. I don't know how you've arranged for that to happen, but I'm sure yes. that'll be coming out soon too. So uh, that's March great. 11. That's great. Yeah. March awesome. 11. <laughs> It'll March 11th. The, okay. The yeah, I know that the turnaround time from movie theaters these days into the uh, online platforms and uh, television platforms are, it's pretty fast these days. Um, so that, that's a, that's another interesting conversation I'm sure we can have. Well, um, it's been so fantastic to have everyone with us tonight and Cindy's going to stay on for a few more minutes. We've got some questions coming in. Welcome, Laura. How are you tonight? Hello. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> what an amazing webinar. What amazing thoughts, Cindy. Thank you so much for sharing. We've got a number of people, Cindy, who are asking for your advice, which you've already shared, but maybe you can just kind of capsulize it. People who have been in the industry, they're either new at producing or they're in that waiting period. You know, you mentioned seven years from conception to finally seeing this movie on the screen. Do you have any um, additional comments you would share just for those people? Yeah, it. I think you just uh, have to accept that that is part of our industry, that uh, <laughs> the old saying, hurry up and wait. But I think that at least as a producer, what's great about being a producer is there's amazing longevity uh, as opposed to an actor. So I would encourage uh, continual, um, you know, study of the industry to expand on your knowledge base and also to meet people, build what I call relationship capital, because in this industry, a lot of it is who, you know, and also, you know, be tenacious and, and uh, getting involved in other projects. I think it's important to kind of, uh, compared to horse racing, that you have a number of ponies on the track. <laughs> that you don't have all your eggs in one basket, that it's all, you're all riding on just one movie idea. And then if some, that pony falls and, you know, breaks a leg, you're just devastated. You have six others you can focus on. But I do think it's important to, you know, have a, a number of projects that you can keep working and pushing forward because you just never know which one's going to hit the finish line first. But it also keeps, I mean, when it's your, your calling, and I am so passionate about my calling, I love what I do. It's so exciting to tell great stories. And I feel like I'm on a treasure hunt all the time. And remember, you don't have to necessarily spend money to find great stories. They can be in the public domain, an historical story that you find, you know, some true story that happened hundreds of years ago, or a couple of thousand years ago. I mean, and anything in between. So I think it's really important to stay active, stay tenacious, um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, 
be anticipatory. I think being anticipatory is really important. Um, don't be that, you know, it, again, it's a choice. So you can choose to be those things and stay active and push yourself and learn and keep a strong work ethic. So. Yes. Very yeah, good. good. Those are, those are great, great thoughts. You know, Cindy, I think the most important thing is we need to read. We need to be out there reading stuff, right? And exactly. and look look for look for those unusual things out there. Um, mm -hmm. Years ago, when I was taking some acting lessons, I was privileged to take uh, a, a lesson from Uta Hagen, oh. um, famous actress, right? Um, yeah, she sat on the stage pretty much with her little puppy dog on her on her <laughs> uh, lap chain smoking the whole night yes you know yes you know and talking to us and but wow what wisdom and I remember um at the time I had uh my daughter who is now in the industry in fact they are uh, had their first feature film um picked up at a several film festivals and they're at one this weekend actually in uh and uh so but anyway I asked Uda that night I said so I have a daughter and uh, she wants to be an actress. So what do I do to encourage her? And, and she's, you know, smoking and reading. And I, and, and uh, she said, well, if it was me, I'd take her and show her and take her to as many things as you, you can take her to. Take her to the opera. Take her to watch how, um, you know, you would feed fish. Take her to how, you know, just take her to every experience you can, you can totally imagine. And make sure she reads. Make sure she's reading, and, you know things because reading is where it happens it happens in your imagination first so uh so i loved your your response there reading so important yeah i would add to what i said uh that especially with today and we have digital that you can make short films you can produce i mean make make shorts go into festivals i mean it's you know i think there's a huge amount of opportunity out there keep keep busy keep honing your craft keep learning keep meeting yes people. keep thinking um another thing is i've continually through my career i will always take a step back to look at the the industry as a whole from a 40,000 foot level to see because hollywood seems to be cyclical you see one volcano movie you see three at the same time <laughs> yeah <laughs> and all of a right. sudden wait a minute, i don't remember family adventure or family movies coming out lately hollywood tends to do that so always take a step back Look at the industry as a whole to see kind of where they are and know, oh, they're not making family movies. Well, time to make, get some family movies together. Um, it, it usually is the case where you'll find when Hollywood goes down one road, they, a lot of them go down that road. And a lot of other roads open up, go down those. Let me just pull up a few questions specific to the movie Redeeming Love. Um, one person is asking, what was the budget for the movie and how did you, how did you make it happen? Uh, I can't say the exact budget, but it was a huge budget for an independent film. And the money was um, uh, raised independently uh, through private investors who, God bless all every single one of them, because um, I look at movies on two levels. Certainly you have you hear the word or the acronym ROI, which is return on investment. But at the same time, and you have to have that because you, you want to be a good steward of the funds and see the investors be able to, to continue on. But I also look at the ROK, return on kingdom, uh, part of the, of the equation. Um, but, um, you know, it's uh, as far as the movie goes, I mean, it's it was, um, gosh, I mean, it was this one was a big one. I mean, it took. Uh, a lot. It took a huge village to make it. It took a long time. Um, it was very challenging on so many aspects with uh, the fact, the enormity of it, just in terms of the scripting and the production. And then, of course, the marketing and the distribution. So were you able to collaborate with the trafficking survivor community through the making of the movie? So I'm so glad that question has been asked because one of the things I really wanted to share with everyone is that this movie has turned into a major movement. The, uh, the wife of our director, DJ Caruso, her name's Holly, and she was responsible for DJ directing the movie. Who's, he's an A-level director, amazing director. She literally had the idea to start up a not-for-profit charitable organization 
uh, off of the movie and it's called the Redeeming Love Sanctuary Foundation. And you can go to redeeminglovesanctuary.org. We've, um, I'm on the board of trustees, Francine's on the board, Roma Downey, and we're filling out the advisory board. Um, and it's, it's absolutely incredible. The, 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 um, the organization follows the work of Angel in the movie, she had, not to give a spoiler alert, but eventually she's working to help survivors who've been trafficked or abused. And so this is a foundation and we've given out four grants already. So, and as far as the organizations, I uh, wanted to share too, Jeff May from Dream City, uh, which is another charitable organization, a, a major organization helping survivors who've been trafficked he said to us after seeing Redeeming Love, this is the first movie he'd been waiting for years for a movie like Redeeming Love to come to the forefront. And he said he, he was blown away because he said this movie is the most um, accurate depiction of the, the journey a woman goes through getting, you know, going through being trafficked and coming out of it. He said 90 percent of women who've been trafficked go back because people who haven't read the book and certainly on the. Uh, certainly in the in the mainstream, some of the critics are, oh, why does she go back, you know, to the paradise, the town that, that she was, she left. It's because that's mostly what women do. They go back. Mm -hmm. That's it. Do you see opportunities for more gritty faith-based movies like Redeeming Love? And do you have advice for screenwriters who want to write that type of material? Well, Redeeming Love, I would say, I hope that there will be more movies made that are authentic and gritty and raw. I mean, it's PG-13. It's not an R-rated movie. Mm -hmm. um, but this movie is, I think this movie is historical because like the age of when Christian Rock came out, I mean, there were literal, I mean, I know some of these musicians had stuff thrown at them when they came out with Christian rock and what a blessing that's been. So, I mean, this, this movie, I mean, for some reason, it's been okay to draw and quarter someone drop, chop their head off, have blood and guts everywhere. But if we have a love scene between a married couple, Oh, that's, we're in trouble here. Um, but <laughs> in that respect, I mean, yes, we've, we've gotten hit pretty hard, but the, the majority of the people who've seen the movie love it. We're 95% in terms of um, audience score. Um, so in that respect though, I, I do hope that this is the beginning of more authentic movies that are, are honest and hit people where they are. Um, and, and life is tough. And a lot of people, I mean, I've been very blessed, but I've certainly gone through tough times. So I certainly encourage the screenwriters out there to write stories that they are called to write and and if and just write great stories i mean there will I and mean, if they write a great script there will be a place in the market that and i think this is this is this is this is why it's historical it's this movie's opening up the marketplace Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah very good so, very good very good and i yes, will just add a right. comment that the atlanta crew Welcome, Atlanta yes. Group. The Atlanta yeah, Crew would Atlanta. like to know. <laughs> they would like to know if casting has begun for the Love Ladies because they're just all right there. <laughs> yeah, no, not yet, not yet. I mean, um, uh, boy, but there will be a lot of casting opportunities for the Love Ladies. So, and by the way, the Love Lady Center. I just have to share. Uh, as I said, it's in Birmingham, and what it is, it's called a hallway house. It's the only one of its kind where the recidivism rate in Alabama was close to 70%. And wow. through the work of the Love Lady Center, which has been a place where formerly incarcerated um, women have come through the center, a year program, faith-based program, over 12,000 women have gone through this the center over the last about 15 years. The recidivism rate has dropped under five. So wow. it is huge. a huge success story. So, I mean, it'll, it'll be a movie that'll make you laugh and make you cry, but it's, it's such, I'm so passionate about this one and I'm passionate about every, <laughs> every one of the movies I've made. <laughs> I wouldn't do it. You have to be, because you're going to be living with it for a long time before you get it made. And then always thereafter. Right. So. 
Yes. That's what yes. You know. Remember, as I said, John 3, 16, God does love you. But I want to leave you this final scripture tonight that the Apostle Paul, a truth that he left us from Romans 8, 38 and 39. Paul says this. He says, so now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with, pow with the power to separate us from the love of God. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death life's troubles, including COVID, fallen angels, and dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us, through the Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one. God loves you. He's lavishing himself upon you and the work and the career that you are heading into and that you are in the, in the midst of and the challenges of the profession. God loves you and he's lavishing himself upon you. Trust him to do that. Our prayer tonight for you as we leave tonight is that God's eternal forgiveness and love will be with you and that the Holy Spirit will envelop your life and bring you peace and provision. Cindy, thank you so much for being with us tonight. You've been so fabulous. Uh, I know you have so much on your plate right now with the movie going on and, and with continuing projects that you're always involved in. Wow. Such a joy to have you with us. No, and, thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone that's listening in. I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful to God for everything that he's done in my life. And I pray that that you'll follow the calling on your life because he has a purpose for each one of you and a calling specific calling for each one of you. So beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. And uh, we're, we're welcoming again, the Atlanta group with um, Anna Oakley there in Atlanta. She was on our influence lab journal today. And if you are not getting the journal, make sure you do at influencelab.com. So thank you so much for joining us wherever you're coming from. We hope to see you again for the in-person gathering here in April in Los Angeles. And hopefully in June there, we're putting together an event in Atlanta. We love you. And I know that God loves you so much. Hugs and God bless you and good night.